Okay. All right. I'd like to reconvene the meeting of the St. Mary's County Board of Education for Wednesday, February 27th, 2019, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I have one addition to the agenda tonight. It will be item 11.04. And the title is Incentive for Advanced Notification of Retirement. So with that, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move approval of the agenda with the addition of item 11.04, Incentive for Advanced Notification of Retirement under the Consent Agenda. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then our next item is a board appointment. Um, underneath Comar and the Annotated Code of Maryland, since we already have a sitting superintendent who has notified the board that he would like to be considered for a, an additional four-year contract, by state law, we have to vote um, to reappoint Dr. Smith by March 1st. So that is the uh, background on this agenda item. So with that, may I have a motion? I move that pursuant to Article 4-201 of the Annotated, Annotated Code of Maryland, that the board reappoint the superintendent, Dr. James Scott Smith, for a four-year term <clears throat> beginning July 1st, 2019, and ending on June 30th, 2023. May I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? <laughs> Just kidding, <laughs> motion carry. <laughs> well Congratulations, enjoy the clap. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's on camera, Jim. That's it. It. So, Thank you. all right. So, with that, Lake, you get to follow with board reports. Awesome. I don't know <laughs> if I can top that, but I hope you guys are all having a wonderful evening. It's so nice to see so many bright, vibrant faces at um, 6 p.m. because I know everybody's tired by this point. Mm -hmm. um, the event I attended this week was the St. Mary's Association of Student Council General Assembly, and technically it was last week because it was held on t February 21st. Um, but basically what we did there was we elected a new student member of the board because I will be leaving after this year. This is my um, final term, and I'll be ending in May. Um, so we elected a new student member, um, and we'll disclose who that person is later. Um, and then we also discussed some different Maryland General Assembly legislation, which is where we'll be having Advocacy Day up in um, like the Baltimore DC area and um, basically what happens is that a group of SMASC people get to come together um, and we have different senatorial bills that are being passed right now and we get to go up and we get to talk to um, some of the people that are in office right now and give their uh, give us um, or give them our feedback on what we think the bill should look like um, so we got to talk with some other students on a more general scale and get their ideas about the bills so we can take that information up to um, Baltimore DC when we when we go um, and then we also just did some SMASC updates between schools um, and we presented some mask updates and the schools that attended were Esperanza Middle School, Leonard Town Middle School, Market Brent Middle School, Spring Ridge Middle School, Chapticon, Middle Sc um, Chapticon High School, Great Mills High School, and Leonard Town High School so we got a good mix of everybody. Thank you. Uh, on Monday um, I attended the um, it was the 59th annual St. Mary's County Science and Engineering Fair uh, Awards Reception. And that was put on by the Patuxent Partnership and the Council on Systems Engineering. It was really neat. So it was middle and high school students that had won awards for their projects. And it was, I found it very interesting going around and speaking with the students and looking at their projects. Um, they demonstrated and explained one of the projects, two young men in, uh, in high school put together a, um, it was a robotic arm. So you stood in front of this TV screen, but it had some camera and you moved your arm and the robot moved its arm along how, you know, whichever way you were moving. It was, it was very unique and neat. Um, there was a young lady who did where you could, uh, crabbers could scan the crabs as they were coming in to make sure that they were the proper size to save them a little bit of time. 
and um, uh, and of course a lot of different ones. But my favorite one was a young man who did about feeding his horses. So he was explaining to me that the horses need to be fed several times a day in order to prevent ulcers. And I guess when he was getting this one horse, it was coming up from, I guess, like Texas or somewhere. And the person that was uh, carrying the horse had to keep stopping to feed it. So he developed a system where on a timer, there was a certain amount of feed in this bucket and it would at certain times drop some feed down for the horse. So I, I thought that was very unique and interesting and it, it solved a problem that he was having. So hopefully one day he'll get that on the market and have it patented and I'm sure that there will be a lot of people interested in purchasing that. So, um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, this, like I said, the students had all different types of projects, um, and you know, way above what I was doing in, <laughs> in middle school and high school. So, had a great time. Uh, uh, I attended uh, the May uh, legislative uh, conference up in uh, Naples, along with all my colleagues and Dr. Smith. Uh, it was quite interesting. Um, uh, we there was a captive audience, so all of the legisl most of the legislators showed up, and uh, it was quite interesting. They uh, talked on various subjects, but all related to uh, affecting the school system, uh, especially the uh, pending uh, legislative bills that, were, uh, that they were going to be voting on. I, I, d I have a whole list, but I, I don't want to go through that. But it was it was a very uh, interesting uh, topic. I also. Uh, attended uh, last Saturday uh, MedStar Health Workshop at, at, for, at the Forest Center. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm a member of the Lions Leonardtown uh, Club and we have a vision uh, a vision center so any, anybody that can come in and uh, we can check their uh, uh, vision for uh, short and uh, long sight uh, defective uh, defects and uh, uh, that lasted for about four or five hours. We didn't have uh, as big a turnout as I was was hoping, but um, I think that was uh, of interest. Uh, also, um, well, I attended the um, Patuxent Partnership um, Awards uh, presentation uh, with um, uh, Mrs. Weaver. And uh, <coughs> lastly, uh, attended the uh, the arts um, demonstration they had down at the Forest Center the other day. And this was uh, young uh, folks uh, showing all of their artwork. It was really amazing. If you, if you hadn't seen it, it was really sh amazing to me, not being an artist, how uh, how c competent they were in their artwork. It was very impressive. All right, so Jim took most of my report with the Mabe Legislative Luncheon, so ditto on that. And then um, a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't mention it at the last board meeting, I did attend the Skills USA competition that was um, at the Tech Center on the, I think it was February 9th. Um, I walked around. They were still doing their electrical and their carpentry. Um, they had the teaching academy. I felt so, it was almost like it was in a, a, a aquarium window because the student was up there, you know, teaching, but yet you could watch from behind. So um, it, they, did, they did a fabulous job and hats off to the culinary students who provided food for everyone who was competing and all of the judges. Um, they also, the one that was really interesting also is that they were doing commercials through the visual media, that they were given topics and then they had, to, they had so much time in order to create a 30 second in radio and I believe uh, you know TV spot so hats off to them uh, I think all of the high schools they're all involved in some type of smack regionals or comp or thing basketball is still going strong so good luck to all of our sports teams I think they um, I know wrestling did well at Chopticon the, the boy uh, the indoor track it's the state meet they did well there too so um, congratulations and good luck to all of the, our student athletes thank you if parents are wondering what their children are going to do when they graduate from high school, one of the good places to go was the 8th Annual Southern Maryland Spring College and Career Festival, which was held at the Forest Center. And it's going to be a presentation on this later on in the meeting, but I highlight one thing that I really appreciated, and that was 
there were many career opportunities there available for students. There were people that had talked to them about right after you graduate from high school, how much money you'll be earning, education benefits, health benefits, everything that students need that they could start work right away after graduating from high school. And um, one was the Maryland Department of Transportation, the uh, Armed Forces, Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines were there, the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office, the Merchant Marines, the St. Mary's County Volunteer Fire Department and Rescue Squad, uh, and somebody represent correctional officers that they could get a job there. So I think, you know, it's going to be presented later, but that's what I really appreciated mm -hmm. that your student can have a job when they graduate from high school. And they talk that, you know, you can go to college as well, but we will pay for your college education and you will be get paid as well. So that was really great to have those representatives there um, with job opportunities for our students because some students will go directly into the workforce <coughs> and some will go directly to college. So um, you'll hear more about it later on. Um, you've heard that we all do uh, quite a bit in terms of being out in the community and visiting schools and visiting um, various events put on by the um, schools. Uh, so you've heard a lot about what I've already done, but what I'd like to highlight tonight is um, that I represent this body on the MABE Legislative Committee. Um, we as a board utilize MABE to um, advocate for us in Annapolis with respect to bills that um, directly affect education. Uh, while there are boards across the state who choose to uh, deliberate on bills and um, discuss them and vote them up or down as far as their support, uh, we have not ever made a practice of doing that. And so uh, we, we utilize MABE in that, res in that respect and, um, and they do so very effectively. Right now, MABE is following more than 350 bills that um, have been dropped that that directly affect education in some fashion. We, you've heard us talk before about going to our fall conference um, that's provided by MABE, and during that conference, uh, any interested member is able to go and, and be part of a general meeting at which we vote on resolutions that determine um, how MABE will advocate on our behalf uh, in Annapolis. So we, we come up with um, res statements of resolution and, um, and then that informs everything going forward. So uh, it's always interesting and um, I try my best to keep my colleagues apprised of anything that I feel is specific to our community, to our county. Um, and one of the important things that I do there is to represent a more rural area um, and a more conservative view. Um, you know, the, we go from all the way from the smallest in Kent County up to the largest in Montgomery County. And so we don't always come about things from the same position. Uh, but I think it's important for them to understand that if they're advocating for um, uh, things that are going to be um, impossible for us to provide because we don't have the resources or we don't have the personnel um, or, and can't even find the personnel, they need to understand that. And, um, and so uh, I, I don't think I'm a thorn in their side, but I, I certainly am vocal. So um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity uh, to represent us and to represent our community um, in Annapolis through MABE. It's a wonderful segue. Thank you for the opportunity. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to all of you for the next four years to continue instead as uh, superintendent. And one of the best things I get to do is to travel to all these events and to share the successes of our, our students and our staff. Um, it really is quite wonderful. An example of this is uh, it can be seen on um, Monday where we go through our day and we're visiting our schools and we're going and seeing the middle school and the principal's advisory council and so late getting out and seeing these middle <laughs> our middle school learners and tomorrow 
Um, Ms. Meadows will be joining us and we're going to have our middle school leaders come in for a day of leadership and conversation and talking about advocacy of our middle school students and that's quite a great opportunity. But that same day on Monday I did get to go down to Great Mills High School to see uh, our wonderful scientists, our future scientists and, and our mathematicians and the STEM students and our great partnerships with the Patuxent Partnership and INCOSI. But then leave there, go up to the Forest Center, walk in the atrium, have Hunter Martin have the LHS band play Crazy Train as I walked in, which, you know, a fan favorite from the, from the 80s, um, and then spend time with Mrs. Washington and a former student who has become a teacher to talk about the wonderful art and experience that she has with kids. That really is quite great. Yesterday, I was at the State Board of Ed meeting in the morning and their meetings start in the morning and they go until about 5.30 at night. So, again, I thank you very much for the opportunity <laughs> to continue in my four years. Um, one of the things that they talked about was teacher certification and how important it is to have the most qualified, dedicated, passionate, creative teacher in front of children. And what they lauded above all else is the, the educators who strive for the, the golden standard of national board certification. I think the current pass rate is about 65% of the people who strive to do this, the, to attain this really wonderful thing. So um, I'm gonna conclude by saying um, I'm really looking forward to recognizing the people who have attained that today. Recognize that we appreciate and, and, and applaud you for your hard work and dedication to our kids, but that's the truth at the state level. These teachers who will be recognized today, that National Board Certification is universally recognized across the United States. You could go to any state, walk in the door, be highly qualified and certificated, and teach. Thank you very much for staying in St. Mary's County, the mother county, the very best place to live and work and raise and spend time with children. Thank you very much. With that, we'll just roll right into you. Mrs. Gill, mm -hmm. you're on. Yes. yes. <laughs> good evening, board. Good evening, Dr. Smith. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. I feel like I don't have to say anything else about I mean, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I wanted to just take a second to refresh memories or maybe tell um, the audience about National Board Certification. And I think the best source would be to go straight toward to the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards. Um, so the National Board Certification was designed to develop, retain, and recognize accomplished teachers and to generate ongoing improvement in schools nationwide. It is the most respected professional certification available in K through 12 education. Created by teachers for teachers, the National Board Standards represents a consensus among educators about what accomplished teachers should know and be able to do. Board certification is available in 25 certificate areas spanning 16 disciplines from pre-K through 12th grade. The certification process requires that teachers demonstrate standards-based evidence of the positive effect they have on student learning in alignment with the five core props, the five core propositions of teaching. They must exhibit a deep understanding of their students, content knowledge, use of data, and assessment and teaching practice. They must also show that they participate in learning communities and provide evidence of ongoing reflection and continuous learning. So National Board Certification is really, truly an accomplishment that demonstrates the whole teaching profession. These teachers have really worked hard over, it's a one to three year path, they have to demonstrate their ability in four different components um, and they truly are a standard to which all teachers hope to achieve. So without further ado, Dr. Smith, would you like to come up sure. and recognize? This year we have five initial certifiers, so this is their first time through. Um, Ready? Okay. Sure, yeah. I'm just um, Mr. <laughs> Brett Johnson, representing Chopticon High School, certified in. <laughs> he's certified in physical education, early adolescence through young adulthood. 
and so tune them to stay. I think we should have them all stay. Um, we have Ms. Taryn Long from Chesapeake Public Charter School. She, she's certified in mathematics early adolescence. Ms. Jamie Penny representing Mechanicsville Elementary School. And Ms. Penny is a generalist in early childhood education. Miss Marjorie Walsh from Great Mills High School. And Miss Walsh certified in English language arts, adolescence through young adulthood. And Miss April Wathen, Letty Marshall Dent Elementary. And Miss Wathen celebrated, uh, cer sorry, certified in library media, um, early childhood through young adulthood. And in addition to our five initial certifiers, we have a renewal candidate. So this candidate initially certified a decade ago and decided to continue her journey um, by renewing her certification this year. And that is Miss Mary Ritter from Leonardtown Elementary School. Um, early childhood generalist as well. All right, thank you. So our, our national board certified teachers. So, well, wait. <laughs> so I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I do, I do know some of you are comfortable speaking. Is there anything you'd like to share? If, if not, I'll just say a couple of things, but Speak now. This is your only. Really, that's it. You're good. Okay. They voted you another four years. Yeah. Right. I guess. I, oh wait. All right. So let's just make ourselves comfortable. No. It it is an exceptional attainment of a professional standard. The Kerwin Commission. Uh, they've spent a year and a half, almost two years, and they continue their work talking about what makes education work. And what makes education work is the teacher in the classroom. And the greatest standard that they can achieve is to be nationally board certified. It is extremely rigorous. Would you all attest to that? Is it one of the most challenging things that you did professionally in your time that you've worked with children? It is based on not only um, the work itself, but on deep reflection and personal improvement. And you are all exceptional standards standard bearers of that. So with that, I want to make sure that the one thing, you can go anywhere in the United States and you will be certified. You can teach anywhere. What is the only place where you want to work? What is the only, where, where is, like what? So let's get a commitment out of you to stay with us until you can recertify. So uh, thank you for being with us and recertifying with us. And please may you all do the exact same thing. Last chance, anybody else? No, thank you, just thank you very much. You want a group picture? Well, are we all right to pause for a second and get a group picture? You are. That'll give me a chance to figure out the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's pause for a second. And we'll, get, we'll get all of you up here. We'll get a group picture, and We're then we'll get our principals to come in. Thank you very much, principals, for coming.
Just give us one second. What are you, She's. Uh, they're making modifications, I think, to the slide. Uh. Then it all falls apart. But that was nice. This would have been very oh, useful. I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> we have them here. I'll make sure that they're not that kind. Oh, yes. I think I'm ahead at this point. I think I'm done at this point. Oh, God. About this, it wasn't loaded. I'm sorry, that's probably my fault. <laughs> so, not only am I to move the podium, uh, but I also should. Sure. Oh, <laughs> yes, you did forget. Sh well, no, we're, we're not. We're not. They're, they, they're presenting from the podium. So, I'm. Oh, okay. I, 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 I'll do my job, I promise. <laughs> because they can go in through board docs. Nope, we got it now. It's, <laughs> Mr. Howard, you're going to have to get up and walk and get within five feet, and then that's. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to do it with? Are you doing the clicker too? I have the clicker. All right. Is that nice. going to work? Did you, did you try it? Yeah. There you, all right. Fantastic. All right. Got the clicker. Okay. Okay. This is Dilla Hunt. Would you like to join me sure. up here today? Hey, hey, hey. So. Um, well, first of all, congratulations, Dr. Smith, for more years. Um, this, I can say that it has been a joy to work with you, and I'm very happy that you were given four more years to work with us. So congratulations. It has been an I'll adventure. Just, and yes, we'll it has been. It ha definitely has been. Yes. <laughs> so um, we tonight, Ms. Dillahunt and I are going to present about the um, HBCU College Fair that Ms. Washington referenced that took place on the 22nd of February. And um, it's really nice to end our celebration of African American History Month being able to talk about this wonderful event. It was, we have a, a fantastic partnership with the NAACP and they work with us. We get a phone call at the beginning of every school year from uh, Dr. Walthour and from Ms. Dillahunt and we come together with myself, Dr. Marr, Ms. Bachner, and these two lovely ladies, and we start to plan and put together who's doing what and how we're gonna make all of this come together and um, you know, figure out what, what's gonna be good, nice for the students. Um, before I go on, I just wanna say that Ms. Dillahunt, she's an assistant principal at Spring Ridge Middle School, as all of you know. She's had a long history of working with St. Mary's County Public Schools prior to her role with the NAACP. So she's community activist and SMCPS employee. And then Dr. Walthour, she is the former president of the NAACP, just recently left a month ago, right? Yeah. How many years did you serve in that role? Actually, just two, but as education chair for I can't even count. For a <laughs> long time, right? Yes. Well, before she did all of that, she was a principal in St. Mary's County and served many years. So she has also has the school system perspective, and it's really wonderful to work with somebody that has been a part of the school system and also in planning these events and is a wonderful community activist. So I wanted to thank you. And there's also another sister uh, that Alfreda Mathis, your sister, your mother, who's also been involved and was a principal in the system. So wonderful history with, um, with this family. And so we do appreciate that and appreciate the relationship then we have with the NAACP. So um, without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Ms. Dillahunt. Do you want to click through or do you want me to click through? You want me? I will click through, but I will give you the mic. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And it's an honor to be here yet again. Uh, another year for the seventh annual Southern Maryland Spring College and Career Fair. I just want to highlight the goal, and I know it's up there, and I don't like to do a lot of reading of you know, PowerPoints, but I do want to read the goal because it is important. Um, the goal is to provide information about diverse opportunities for accessible, affordable, vocational, or university college education that will lead to an equal opportunity to achieve economic success, sustainability, and financial security. And that's what we strive for, we all strive for um, here in our school system, in America, we, we are striving for our students to have success um, in whatever way possible, substantially, financially, and so that's what the college fair's goal is and that's what we move forward to, uh, move towards every year. Um, and, and having said that, every year um, we get an opportunity, a tremendous opportunity to, to be able to come together to provide a service for the students of Southern Maryland. And having said that, it's a unique opportunity for those students to kind of experience and access a wide variety of colleges that would enable them, and careers, opportunities, that would enable them to make a better choice about their post-secondary academic life. And that opportunity should be never ending. And I know that um, we, we move, we meaning the college, spring college fair moves in conjunction with the fall college fair. We want students, all students, to have the opportunity to be able to experience all types of colleges, career opportunities, and so that's why um, this is so important to us. So if we click to the next slide with the participants, and just talking about who the participants are, of course our students. We had three high schools, um, Great Mills High School, Choptakan High School, Leonardtown High School, Fairlead one and two, and we had middle school, Spring Ridge Middle School that attended. We also had College of Southern Maryland students attending who were interested, interested in transferring uh, from College of Southern Maryland to, Maryland to a four-year college. We had other college, uh, high schools in the county uh, Patuxent High School came out this year. We had um, North Point High School came out this year uh, in numbers. And so it, it's really picking up in the Southern Maryland area. Um, a lot of, um, um, I'm sorry, a lot of the um, counties are finding it a wonderful opportunity for them to come down to the Southern Maryland um, Spring College Fair at this time. So let's move forward. Thank you. And so these are all of the colleges, uh, the career opportunities that were available. I believe overall there were over maybe 40 and uh, colleges and careers there and also opportunities for students to have summer internships. And I have to say something, the abacus table had so many students around it. It was the, one of the hits of <laughs> the college fair. They were asking, where is that table? Where is the table? And we announced it and the kids were just uh, crowded around it, crowded around um, the fire and rescue, crowded around St. Mary's um, County Sheriff's Department. And I just thought it was a wonderful opportunity for them. Some of the students had no idea of all the services and all of the career opportunities available. And it really just gives um, them a great, um, it's a great way for them to be able to establish um, a relationship with those organizations. And our partnerships, um, we had several more um, uh, people that had donated, but these are our partners. Uh, keeping students on track, the St. Mary's County Public Library, our minority outreach, job source, our St. Mary's County, of course, um, Board of Elections, St. Mary's County Government, St. Mary's County Academy Programs and AP, Walden, Wells Fargo, Becca College Access Program, and our young, uh, youth and young adult services. So here's the big deal, okay? So we had a great turnout this year, and um, our numbers show we had about 281 students. I think it was a little bit more than 281 because it was a lot of uh, students there. But 281 students attending. 
And the breakdown of high schools, 68 for Great Mills High School, Choptacon, 52, Leonardtown, 94, um, Fairlead Academy, 22, Springer's Middle School, 35, and other schools, um, 10. I think there's a higher number there because there was a lot more students from North Point, Patuxent. So I would say we were close to our 300 mark, maybe a little bit over 300, but we did go by the specific numbers that we counted. And the big deal, we had um, 20 students who received on-the-spot acceptances and over $19,000 in scholarships awarded, and these are all of the, the schools. I know we have a few more out there because um, a good way that we kept track this year, which I'm very, very proud of, is, and I don't have it on here, here, but actually the students would get a form, and it's called I'm In. That's the new thing, I'm In. And they would get the form, they'd fill out their I'm in form with their information, and then they would bring the form up to the podium, they would get announced, and basically I'd say, Dr. Maureen Montgomery, I'm in. <laughs> she has been accepted to blah, 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 college, she's in, and then she'd have her I'm in sticker, and she would go to the I'm in table, she would take a picture. So this year was a really good process of kind of getting, um, keeping track of some of those students who got accepted on the spot. We did miss a few because some of them were so excited they just ran on out the building and onto their bus. <laughs> and so I know there, there were more students that were accepted on the spot. Um, however, I, I really believe um, in looking at some of our um, evaluations and hearing some of the comments that this was one of our most successful college fairs yet. And we are pressing forward to our eighth annual college fair and <laughs> career fair. And we thank you for your support. And we want to continue to partner with you for many years to come. <laughs> All right. Very much. We do take next steps also. So we have 20 students that receive scholarships. And then we take the, the names of those 20 students. We go back to the schools. We have the counselors follow up with them follow up with them about financial aid, about what they need to do to complete their applications. So we take the next steps with the kids so we can do as much as we possibly can to get them interested in, in um, going to the school. So very exciting, very exciting. I so one more thing to say. Oh, yes, we have to move forward. But I did give you just a sample of what, and actually it's a mixture between what the career and college, um, the career organizations and college recruiters got and the students. So in the packet, there is, of course, a listing of the students, I mean, the uh, colleges and career organizations that attended. There is a schedule set up as to, as to you know, where every, what, what time all the students would be coming in. There is information on our partnerships and information on what you do before you visit a college fair. It's kind of some think abouts and, and things for students. There is a lovely flyer in here about our Teacher Academy of Maryland, our Teacher Academy program. And they were, again, wonderful hosts uh, for our, our program, and we partner with them every year, as well as the Culinary Arts program. Um, I'm trying to, Culinary Arts, Graphic Arts, Hospitality, Am I missing anyone? I know I am. But we, um, we partner with that, the uh, Forest Center students in those programs. And we have the Planning for College, which is amazing. This book has all types of planning for college, for middle school, for high school, checklists, everything, and those students got that. And then in honor of the HBCUs, they've got a little card here that says, what is a historically um, black college and university? And on the back, there are different historically black colleges and universities highlighted, and they got a chance to see, you know, this one's the Virginia State University and the history of that particular HBCU. That's it. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Smith, do you want to? Well, so I think we'll pause and get a okay. picture, but well. <laughs> Oh.
I, in, I, was, I was there that day, and you can feel the excitement in the students that came that day. Uh, I was introduced to a young gentleman who was coming out, and I don't think he went back and filled out a form. But when he got there in the morning, he didn't have his transcript. He didn't really have a plan. He hadn't filled out his FAFSA, and he hadn't really thought about a college or university. He spent 35 minutes in there, came back out, we printed him out a transcript so he could bring it back. Norfolk College said, oh my gosh, look at this transcript. He had A's and B's and it was great. He came back out, they filled out a FAFSA form, they went back in and he was offered. That young man told me he wants to become a secondary uh, education major. So I said, here's the deal, go to Norfolk, finish in four years, come back, we'll give you a job. That young man, walked in the door of the tech center without a plan and walked out with a four-year degree pathway program and employment. Mm -hmm. And most importantly to me is that he wants to be, a, he wants to be an educator. Um, and that, that's, incredib that's incredibly important. The only way we are going to meet the critical shortage of educators that is, that is here right now and will do nothing but become more dire is to inspire our young people to work with our children. And I'd just like to applaud you, Ms. Dillahunt, specifically, Dr. Wathauer, for un an unwavering amount of support that you have shown your entire life to children in St. Mary's County and the school system in the community. And so with that, I'd love to have a picture taken, if we could, of all of us up here. And so can we, can, can we pause again and take a picture? So we can have this on the front. All right, that's awesome. Four more years, we're here to make you happy, yes. <laughs>
four more years. <laughs> okay, let's see. Before we go to the CTE grant, mm -hmm. uh, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda as amended. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Now, you're on. Do you gavel in, or what do we got to do? Um. Ta-da! <laughs> Robert's roll. Right, there you go. Do we uh, have to do the consent agenda again, then? I really, I, it's really just so she tapes it. Got it. <laughs> we were rolling. You good? Yeah, Here we go. Good to go. All right, a little background on our innovation grant. Um, in July of 2018, Governor Hogan had earmarked uh, $2 million for CTE innovation to uh, the counties of Maryland. It was a competitive grant in which we wrote a grant for cybersecurity. Uh, some of our needs with cybersecurity obviously are a, a little bit of uh, security inside of our own infrastructure. So what we were looking to do, and we've worked together with um, MSDE, is the grant kind of worked around, we worked very closely with MSDE, um, especially Miss Mary here, uh, because she knows the jargon, the talk. I, I don't, you know, so <laughs> she knows what she was actually buying. So in this grant, we're going to create, well, Mary, tell us what we're going to create. <laughs> <laughs> Please share what the intricacies of cybersecurity. Yeah, so um, our hope and goal was was to create basically a cyber ranger, cyber lab that students would have hands-on experience um, either installing, um, deploying, and um, troubleshooting actual computer systems, networking devices, um, building on the cybersecurity, being able to launch attacks, do viruses, um, hack, you know, those type of things that all sound very scary when they're sitting inside of a school. Um, and we wanted to create something so that we could have those devices that can do that, but it would be isolated, so it would be protected. Um, and then also be able to, um, part of this grant that we wrote into it was um, something that we're going to pilot with other counties. So um, we're gonna create as a professional development for other teachers to come in and build with that and then eventually our long end goal is that we actually would connect to other similar classes, IT classes, cybersecurity classes in the state, um, and to make it sound fun, basically be able to launch attacks on other classes and do things and learn and kind of be able to use the resources outside of our classroom um, that maybe we can provide, kind of spread the resources out a little bit. So that was kind of the background to what we wanted to do. So ultimately what we're doing is building an infrastructure that might reach across the entire state. So for us right now, there's three counties. It's us, Howard County, and an Eastern Shore County. And I, I, I keep meaning to look that up, but I, I forget. Um, so ultimately I think, and that's why we're working so closely with MSDE, is this infrastructure is going to be all across all state and everybody's going to be able to do what hopefully Mary's going to be able to do as soon as, soon as next year, attack Howard County or <laughs> protect from Howard County attacking us. Um, so that's that's what we're, we, we put in for uh, right now. Uh, three counties did were, have been granted this. And so on January 24th, the project was approved. Um, we were awarded $133,529. Um, f for this fiscal year, um, which means we we still have plenty of time. I mean, we're we're going to do it now. If I went to the next the slide, I've kind of already talked to you about our cooperation with MSDE, but here I kind of I've kind of talked about in the spring of 2019. Well, we've pushed it out a little bit. We've had to. The other two counties are going to still do it in the spring. They're going to be mid-March. They're going to put theirs together. And, and what's the kind of cool thing about it is they've already purchased their stuff and are ready to build. And the teachers from around the state will professional development to those areas. So when with them doing that both in March, we're going to do ours in the summer with MSD. So we'll professional development here in the summer. All those teachers from around the state will come and build ours. It'll already, it's already been spec'd out, um, and that's the really nice part about it. I mean, we don't, our procurement is 
already kind of done for us. MSDE has already figured that all out, what everything needs for everything to, to talk together. And that's obviously where Mary and MSDE really came in. And she was probably the true selling point of this because she was able to talk those. I, I couldn't talk to Jason. I, I, didn't, know, I didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> um, but obviously Mary could, and, and I think she really sold it. And, and we were lucky enough to be one of those three that got it. Um, basically what we're asking today is a recommendation that the board approve the the agenda as presented for our acceptance for the innovation grant I have no questions for you please time. ask Mary <laughs> <laughs> no questions thank you well I don't have a question right at this this moment but I am very much in favor of the tech center. I've said this so many times. My son went through this tech mm -hmm. center and he was in the IT networking, mm -hmm. came out with a certification and right now he is in cybersecurity and very successful and loving his job. I'm glad to see that you went from the two-year program and added this because um, he tells me all the time that they, they are in need of people with the certification. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's it's great, um, and I would like to see that it it does go, uh, you know, throughout the state because I think that you know with having more people in the networking system, that the students would, um, I guess you know more challenges um, and you know uh, being able to block the people coming in versus you know sneaking in there and and. Uh, hacking their system. So mm -hmm. uh, great job, great uh, writing for your grant, and uh, wish you success, and look forward to seeing what, what all you do with it. Probably the other two counties need to thank Mary as well, because I think it was Mary's initial conversations with Jason that made them start thinking about how to, we, we put in a grant for it, but it was the conversations that they had with Jason, and then they were like, wait a minute, okay, a real classroom of this matter would cost in the millions. How can we do this so that it's not one place? And that's how they've decided to, mm -hmm. to have the, each little piece everywhere. So, um, and when you're speaking I mean, of Jason, you're speaking of say it again. He was Jason. Jason. Uh, Jason is with MSD, and I don't know his last name. Oh. Caller. He. Okay. okay. <laughs> there you go. Jason Caller. He's the CTE, MSDE uh, innovation like um, representative li liaison. Fantastic. So, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I have no questions other than uh, echoing uh, Mrs. Weaver's comment. Getting that grant, you got the money there. You better get it before somebody else. So mm -hmm. kudos to you guys to uh, take the initiative to get to get the money. Thank you. Right. We'll just we'll all pile on Rita's comments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ditto on that one too. But I do have. I read an article. Um, UMBC apparently has one of the most robust cybersecurity programs in the state. And um, their graduating class has, all, like I believe in November, had already 100% of them had already secured jobs mm -hmm. with companies. Yeah, so yeah, this absolutely. is, you know, yeah. clearly, you know, and with Amazon moving all around, and you know, now not going into New York and maybe coming back to Maryland, it's just, or, you know, it's just, it, <clears throat> it's yeah. I have a, to speak for the incredible. program. Yeah, I have a student that actually is at the UMBC Cyber mm -hmm. Program now, and because of. Going through my class and getting the certifications, so you can actually graduate a whole semester early Great. because of it. So, yeah, so it's really neat to see the pipeline yes. in works. Right. Know. So, so excellent job. Thank you. So. I am glad it moved from the two-year program to the three-year program. So when the students graduate from the three-year program, will they have certifications? And what will those certifications be? <laughs> so they, they have options for a lot of, but. Yes. Yeah, they have options. Um, so we, I prepare them based on the objectives for the industry certifications. Um, and the two major partners that really feed the program and that are the most industry recognized are Cisco and CompTIA. Um, and so we really built that around there. So in the first year, I really prepare them. Um, there's an intro to like a fundamental certification then the A+, which is kind of the one that's really coveted by workforce as an entry level. Uh, my second year, they can prepare for what's called the CSENT, which is the Cisco Networking Certification, um, and then and or the Network Plus, which is the CompTIA version, <clears throat> a little bit broader of a certification. Um, and then now with the cybersecurity piece is that 
kind of last carrot is that security plus, which is really vital for students just to get into the workforce, especially around here with the Department of Defense and government. Um, so those are just the base for one that I go on. Um, I actually have 16 certifications total that are optional for students to do self-study or provide for to test for um, that my curriculum covers. So. And college credit, yes, they do get <laughs> college articulation um, with CSM and Stafford University, and we're working with other universities to mirror that. So that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it is, and I and I think I, I have <coughs> eyes in the back of my head because I'm sure Dave Howard's back there shaking his head. <laughs> we did mention, and hopefully you understand, it's it, this will be a separate entity, so this infrastructure won't. That's one of our biggest concerns. Were always that our infrastructure was connected to the school and these. Um, these kids are pretty, they're going to be pretty good hackers, so they could have easily probably worked their way into our systems in, in some manner. So this is a, not, what do you call it, standalone? I, I don't know isolated. what it, Isolated. Isolated, yeah, isolated. Mm -hmm. um, I, in one of the um, artifacts that you provided us, um, you show, uh, or someone shows an IT networking academy um, suggested high school sequence of courses. Um, do you anticipate that we're going to follow this sequence? I mean, in other words, I was talking with someone today um, who said that um, they have a child who's a sophomore um, but knew that they would love to get involved in something like this. Is it too late? Um, how, I mean, how... Yeah. Well, uh, well, go ahead, yeah, well, Mr. Reagan. One of the opportunities we do have is um, it, we're hoping this three-year program fills obviously when they have we have that full cohort one of the opportunities we have implemented is that students can come in in their senior year and take the final course as an elective as long as they have the prerequisite of AP computer science at the high schools mm -hmm. so that it, we're hoping it fills but in the event for whatever reason that it doesn't we're trying to open those doors for other students to be able to come in and experience some of this uh, and get some of that opportunity even if they're not in the full three-year program and I'm glad because one of the things we hear often is, or at least I do, is, wow, you waited until I was gone to do this. Um, and so I, I really applaud you for um, working through this and being one of the three counties that's going to be able to um, be on the ground floor of doing this. Um, and, and, and I think we all understand that um, this is a, a field that is, that is desperately seeking people um, and so hats off to you and I look forward to hearing about updates I would like to see this put in as um, a pathway program and um, yeah that we could actually see that and I was just going to mention to you um, we could actually see that much like the homeland security pathway that has been placed in because of the need of it I think we may see a move toward this that there will still be an IT piece a two-year piece and then a uh, security and you'll be able to choose one of those two I I can see the state making that move I, I mean I would hope that we could you, you know how difficult it is to find teachers that can teach that kind of course obviously and of course infrastructure of having a course classroom for it and stuff but I think you I think write down I think the way you're thinking this could actually be a cybersecurity pathway CTE pathway I would, I would really love to see us pursue something like that. I think um, there are a lot of people out there who are interested, and, um, and there are certainly employers who are extremely mm -hmm. interested. Um, I look at the hospital, um, who you know, has I all look kinds at of us. problems. <laughs> yes. I look at us yes. and recognize the value of the, mm -hmm. of the program. So really, we need to work with STEM, because what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to clone Mrs. Thompson, <laughs> um, because ultimately, and I do want to just take a moment, we're recognizing National Board Certified Teachers for the National Board Certification. The work that you do every single day to be as abreast as possible with all of this ever-changing, incredibly complex work um, is really to be applauded. You know, so thank you very much for working with whoever Jason may be and bringing, <laughs> bringing this down here and making us recognize a model. You know, we're talking about Howard County with its billion dollar budget. You know, we just kind of trudge along down here and um, we, the strength that we have is the strength of our people and the strength of our people, Ms. Thompson, is you. So just thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion? 
I move that the Board of Education approve acceptance of the innovation grant and applicable budget and the submittal of the grant budget to the commissioners of St. Mary's County for their approval. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Motion's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Ethical right. hacking in a sandbox you create. <laughs> Mrs. Yeah. Thompson, good for you. Thank you. All right. The recommended budget. This was the action item postponed from the snow day. the discussion I was going to say ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. Scott, you can do your job and move your evening. oh my gosh I see he's this he's the only day you're going to get <laughs> away with it right on my laurels, he's, yeah he's cruising on his laurels here this is it next time you're not going to get away with it <laughs> yeah we can because probably have one of those day. science Lake fair projects as an <laughs> automated arm that just kind of brings it back. Maybe I think he's trying to groom me to be able to. Mrs. Thompson, we need to get like some robotic. <laughs> put it on a Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we'll be, before you this evening for the approval of the fiscal 2020 budget. You've received a very detailed budget presentation on the superintendent's budget in January, a work session, and followed by a public hearing receiving community comment. So these slides are exactly what we presented at your last presentation, so I'll just quickly go through it. Bottom line, we're looking at a $224.5 million budget for FY 2020. That includes $110 million in local funding support, which is a $6.7 million increase, and $109 million in state funding support, or a $3.5 million increase. So we've broken it down into three primary areas, the negotiated agreements and incremental increases of $7.9 million, $1.3 million for unfunded mandates for safety and security and mental health, and recommended enhancements for SMCPS in the amount of $992 million, for, so an overall increase to the FY20 budget of $10.3 million. The negotiating agreements and incremental costs include the health insurance increase currently in your budget at 5%. We should be getting those numbers within the next couple of weeks, the exact numbers from Care First. For an item of $1.5 million, utility increase anticipated $414,000. Bus contracts and fuel, $654,000. And of course, the step, COLA, and fixed charges associated with that of $5.3 million for a total of $7.9 million. And then we have all of the mandates associated with safety and security and mental health. Our psychologists and counselors, the school social worker, mental health coordinator, and safety and security coordinator were both incorporated in the current year's budget via budget adjustment approved by you earlier. Safety and security assistance and IT project coordinator, security specialist, physical security systems, and an increases in three additional areas within safety and security for overtime materials as well as contracted temp agency, totaling $1.3 million. So we're now up to a $5.7 million funding necessary to um, fund the priorities one and two from the county commissioners. And then the recommended enhancements for St. Mary's County Public Schools include the special education IEP chair, five teachers, a nurse, reclassifications, as well as internships for our students, totaling $992,000. So the total increase, once again, is $10.3 million for FY 2020, and local funding increases requested at $6.7 million. So your approval is requested today. That will then be submitted to the county commissioners for consideration. They will take it and incorporate it in their budget for April 23rd at their public hearing. And May 14th, the commissioners will provide the final direction on their operating budget. And May 22nd, the Board of Education will be expected to adopt your budget. So at this time, we request your approval of the fiscal year 2020 budget. I have no questions. Thank you. No questions. Thank you for the presentation. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. None. Thank you. No questions, but I want to thank the superintendent for putting people first. We always must. All right, may I have a motion? 
I move the Board of Education approve the recommended budget for fiscal year 2020 as presented and forward to the county to the commissioners of St. Mary's County for the re, their review and approval. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carried. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Let's see. All right, literacy coaches overview to the group that's been waiting very patiently. Yes, they have, and thank you. <clears throat> okay. Hello again. Hello. Um, Hello again. We are thrilled to present the literacy coaches to you this evening. Um, it's been a long time coming. Um, so just to give you some background, the literacy coaches were born as a result of the Striving Readers Grant, um, which you will be hearing about momentarily. Um, they are to support teachers in implementing disciplinary literacy, working with teachers on what literacy means in each content area. Um, and the main focus is on tier one interventions with teachers. Tier one interventions are interventions that happen within the classroom. Um, so really working with teachers on how to support the literacy in their content with the students in their classrooms. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Lynn Traherne, Patricia, Lynn Traherne could not be with us tonight because she is actually facilitating a parent session um, as part of her role as literacy coach um, on conscious discipline. So she is, she is facilitating a parent training on conscious discipline tonight. Um, but just to give you sort of a background of what she does, Lynn supports birth through second grade. Um, she develops connections with agencies outside of the school system. So just to tell you a little bit, she works with the Early Childhood Action Committee from, for St. Mary's County, the Judy Center Steering Committee. Um, she connects with Promise Resource Center, um, the Maryland Office of Child Care. Um, so she does a lot with parents and working with the younger, younger children. Um, as part of her professional development, she works with teachers on IGDs, universal screening to support, it's a pre-K assessment to support pre-K students, um, conscious discipline training, as I said, which is where she is tonight, um, imagine learning training with our teachers, and really she works to, um, with the targeted schools that Ms. Pepper will talk a little bit about, um, she builds relationships with staff um, and really supports them through foundation implementation or other curricular um, needs. Next and we have. Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jamie Pepper, so I am one of the literacy coaches. Um, I'm supporting grades um, K through five, working closely with Courtney Dvorak, who's the supervisor of elementary ELA instruction, and um, Lynn mm -hmm. Traherne. Um, we do have the overlap of K through two. Um, prior to this, I was an IRT at Duke Elementary, um, so I've reached out to my IRT friends in other buildings and started. Um, getting myself into schools by attending their data meetings. And as we reviewed their data, um, needs popped up here and there. And so then I was able to go into teachers' classrooms and um, uh, model lessons and help them um, get resources, um, provide professional development. Um, I'm working with first year teachers. I'm working with veteran teachers. I'm working with special education teachers. Um, and um, it's, it's all been very well received. So um, um, it's been a great start with it. So I'm happy to be in this position. Thank you. Um, and we have three secondary literacy coaches. Um, so they're gonna come up and introduce themselves one at a time. Good evening, my name is Stephanie Stone. I'm the secondary school's literacy coach that supports Choptagon High School, Lairtown Middle School, and Margaret Brent Middle School. Uh, prior to this, I was a science teacher at Choptagon High School. Um, one year long initiative that we've been working on even I think the two of us were still teachers before we took over the roles as literacy coaches um, was a um, development um, administration and analysis of a performance-based assessment for ninth grade students in the content areas of ELA English language arts science and social studies so we helped other teachers and along with the content supervisors to create these performance-based assessments 
um, to administer them in the schools and then now actually this Friday we're having a conversation bringing the teachers back to see how it went um, what kinds of initiatives and kind of next steps um, that we can work with the students in those three content areas in terms of um, reading and writing one uh, piece of data that our um, park data came back with for our students in the middle and high school were that our students needed support in informational text, having to actually read it, access it, give uh, textual um, evidence. So these performance-based assessments in the three areas came about with teachers and supervisors and kind of analyzing that data and then the next steps for the following year to kind of gear those specifically towards the three content um, areas, the three disciplines so that students in the English language arts classes, kind of how they are supposed to be writing and accessing text in social studies courses for the high school assessment in government, and then in science for the uh, MISA, the um, integrated science assessment. So kind of that um, is the progression from this year to next year that we're working on. So in terms of kind of support and professional development, that's one main focus that we've been doing this year for all three of the literacy coaches in secondary schools. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Rebecca Waite, the literacy coach at Great Mills High School. I also support Spring Ridge Middle School and Esperanza. Um, Kelly Bridges and I, also, she also supports um, Esperanza since they both feed into um, either Leonardtown High School or Great Mills High School. Um, I'm going to kind of piggyback off what Stephanie was saying about the PBAs. Um, one of the things that we were able to do with that is collect data off of Unify. And one of the amazing conversations that I've been able to have with teachers at the high school level and middle school level is the student's um, PBA score in all three of those assessments and how they align to their park scores. And then we can have really rich conversations with the students about their own performance and getting them to really own um, the seriousness of, of these assessments and um, kind of figuring out what skills they needed or were lacking in those assessments, looking at it across the board and seeing if they were lacking the same skill um, in each of those. And then we can go in and kind of tailor a little instruction for them and give them little tips and hints on how to improve their rate, uh, reading and writing. So um, that's been great to have those conversations with teachers, with students, and um, it's sometimes it's the aha, like, I, I just need to change that. And it's, yes, that's, that's it, and you're, you're great, you're golden. Um, so that's been um, an amazing opportunity to have with teachers and students. Um, the other thing we can um, go in and kind of focus on universal design um, for learning and if a student is struggling to obtain some content or as Stephanie mentioned the text-based evidence is really trying to find a strategy that helps that student so getting to know the students um, getting to know their learning and then providing them with um, different options for them to to kind of use as a toolkit toolkit when they're struggling um, so the students not only are seeing their data and are um, being connected to that more, they're also getting ideas on how to fix their reading and writing. And so hopefully we'll go forward and see lots of progress from this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kelly Bridges. I'm the literacy coach supporting Leonardtown High School, Esperanza Middle School, and Leonardtown Middle School. Um, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more too on the UDL initiatives. Uh, we're also supporting teachers in implementing uh, what's called Goal Book and Pathways software. It's a software tool that you can easily find uh, strategies and resources to help those struggling students, uh, especially with literacy initiatives. So uh, one thing I've been doing is meeting, we, again, the focus has been on ninth grade right now, uh, meeting with ninth grade teachers to use this software and to help them uh, differentiate their classes. That's especially important as we've uh, moved. We don't have standard CM, now we have just one on grade level group. So we have a lot of diverse learners in one classroom and teachers need supports to reach these students, especially when it comes to literacy. Um, so that's been another one of our initiatives that we've been taking on. Another aspect of our role is co-teaching and modeling lessons. And that's probably the most fun part of our role. Um, 
is getting in there and working with teachers in the classroom to implement these strategies. Uh, one example, um, I've been working with teachers who want to hold writing conferences with their students. They want to sit down and have personal conversations with their students. That's really hard to do with you know 30 high schoolers in a room uh, so I'll go in and maybe do a little mini lesson um, while that teacher is working with other uh, students uh, just to add that kind of uh, flexibility for them um, I've also gone into science classrooms to help support writing instruction modeling for the science teachers how they can implement disciplinary literacy how they can give feedback to student writing um, and showing them that it's a it's a reading and writing is an accessible tool in all classes that these students and teachers are in. You don't have to leave. Oh. <laughs> you can stay right up you there. Can stay right right there. there. Um, if I can just speak on behalf of the entire um, Department of Curriculum and Instruction, um, we are very proud of the, the five literacy coaches that um, are working with us. They are all master teachers. They are all highly respected. They come from a variety of content areas. Um, from science, uh, childhood, early childhood, um, English language arts. So they really are welcomed in teachers' classrooms with their ideas and, I mean, they, they just breathe life into everything they do and we're just thrilled to have them on board. No? You, you took all... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> all my stuff. I was going to... For the record, I, I, was, I wrote down, so I was going to say all of that oh. stuff because... Yeah, that's it. Oh, well. <laughs> Find some new words. <laughs> Ask a literacy coach. Yeah. <laughs> I have a strategy for you. Yeah. 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 But, I, but I do, and I don't want to step on the board, but I do want to say, you know, the first of all, thank you all for your incredible patience yeah. and that this grant was received and and you were identified as the master teachers that you are and we many you had to wait because how could you, you're all irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. And that was a that has been an absolute challenge. But that, when we talk about what makes the system better, it really is. It's all about people. It's about how you invest in people. Uh, to the extent to which we can uh, exercise influence over pre-service to help our institutes of higher education really prepare people before they come here. But realistically, once they're here, they're ours. And so then it becomes in-service. And in-service is best done when it's embedded. And it's best done when it's modeled and co-taught and so you, I mean you hit all the words the only thing you are all exceptionally credible the teachers know you have walked the walk you know it you you can you can perform in front of a classroom you can put together assessment you can make the unify system sing and that is something at the <laughs> secondary level that we we really need to invest our time in because the when we look to and model after what our elementary folk are doing and and our middle school folk we recognize the incredible power of that analytical tool system um, so you just you are the fabulous five. Thank you for your patience. I can't. I know that you're now getting into that meaty bit of the work. I can't wait to see what the next two or three years will yield. So just thanks. Okay. And you did. You. Like, well, no, really fabulous insane. five. I'm yeah, thinking, we, I'm yeah. thinking t-shirts. Oh yeah, get that. Yeah, fab five. That's fun. <laughs> fab five. Okay. I, I do have a question. Um, you talked about supporting English language arts, science, and social studies, but I didn't hear math, and. Um, so could somebody tell me about, is there any plan to support literacy in math? I so mean, that might have to wait for the grant. Um, the literacy coaches have to, they, they are within the bounds of the grant. Right. So um, literacy within math is very important, and our, our math supervisors talk about it frequently, um, word walls, word walls, word walls and, and moving from there, yes. Um, currently, we are working with English language arts, science, social studies, those contents. Yeah. Um, there may be application, but again, it's within the confines of the grant, and so and That's this particular not what we're doing right now. This particular grant, you all have made it sing as far as what you've been able to extract from a, a, a narrow focus to be a much wider and a much more comprehensive system view. Um, I think it really is. It's it's fantastic. So the next time they throw out a grant, we'll drag in the math supervisors. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I look at you know, word problems and yes. and yes. being able to express how you solved a problem 
using, um, you know, writing about it. And so that's why it struck mm -hmm. me that there is that literacy component there. Um, I, but I would imagine that through a lot of the professional development you do, that um, there's sort of a bleed over. Oh, absolutely. In that. I mean, if you're, when you're talking about PBAs and you're talking within the mm -hmm. science field, you, of course, there's going to be a major mathematical component to it. So. Um, I can speak to that just a little bit in some of the work I've done at Leonardtown High School because on their math assessment, students are expected to write and elaborate. Um, and that's, you know, a struggle across the board, getting students to elaborate. So I have attended some of their data meetings just to offer some strategies and advice for that. Um, I send out as part of uh, Miss Mill's weekly update, I do my own little literacy coach corner where I, get to see it. Yeah. Where, where I offer little There's tips more. to parents. So I try to include uh, like vocabulary reading strategies that are applicable to all content areas, not necessarily just those. Because we, we, we even talked about you know what we can do in foundations of technology, bringing in mm -hmm. articles mm -hmm. for students to read in there in health class. So it's really, it, it is about meeting the school's needs too, mm -hmm. where we can fit that in. Great, thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you have any questions? Oh, no, I was just going to say, you guys had a wonderful presentation, and it's so nice to see people who are passionate about what they're doing, because it definitely reflects, you know, what you're doing and how you're working towards where you want to go. So I'd just like to thank you all for being here and doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My question is for Ms. Pepper. Um, you go into the classroom, and now do you observe the teacher and kind of see where she needs assistance and is it for mm -hmm. the classroom in general or is it um, are you looking at specific children that she can assist okay. <laughs> um, so what what I've done so far is I've gone in um, to help model lessons um, if a teacher is interested in um, Daily Five is a big frame uh, format that we're um, doing right now. Um, so if they're interested in an aspect of that, I've gone in to help model lessons. I have gone in to, you know, like teachers might say, I just want you to come in and see what I'm doing and then, and then give me some advice. Okay. Um, I have not been observing specific children. I've been working with teachers and their whole classes. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. It does. I just wanted, like, I guess a little bit more clarification on like kind of your role in the classroom right I've I've um, f after attending those data meetings um, whatever comes out of that data meeting people have said um, we just want to hear more about daily five we want to hear more about guided reading um, so I've provided professional little mini professional development sessions for those things um, some teachers know exactly what they want like um, you know I want I need help with work on writing with my kids so okay. I've gone in and modeled lessons for work on writing I've watched them do work on writing and um, given them feedback um, so it's just kind of whatever sort of pop right now that's how it's presented itself okay. what's ever sort of popped up out of those data meetings okay. um, as being the need of the teacher and then me going in to support them in that Okay, thank you. And I don't know if it helped. So the literacy coaches, their primary focus is to support teachers with the literacy. Mm -hmm. So not to maybe identify students. Um, but if a teacher were to identify a student who was having um, struggles in a certain area, then the literacy coach and the teacher could work together on different strategies um, to okay. implement. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, thank that you. That hasn't popped up yet, but <laughs> it does. I will do that. It does. Okay, thank you. okay. All right. Uh, I, the only question I have is I think earlier you were talking about addressing age groups like from birth to pre-k. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do f when, you, when you're working with a, a child that's just been born, there's no cognitive abilities, so what would you be doing there? I'd, I didn't well, that's Lynn Traherne's specialty, and she's not here tonight. But I do know that um, it would be working more with the parents yes. and the caregivers at that point of, you know, the importance of reading to your child mm -hmm. and, and things like that. I can't speak to yeah. it specifically, but it would be right. working more with the adults that are dealing with the, um, right. with the infant than, obviously, the yeah, infant I, itself. I, I, we've talked about this before. I, it, there's been a lot of studies that show that children that are read to at an early age and mm -hmm. uh, do much better academically as they as they advance to the school system. And in, in fact, in one of our um, meetings for the Striving Readers Grant, they were talking about 
a program that I th- I feel was it I don't know if it's still in place at the hospital but like what after you had a baby like you went home with a couple of books or something like yes. that mm-hmm. so it if is. it if it isn't still in place they were going to revisit that or support that in some in some way thank you that's all I have. okay Well, I see you as exemplary teachers, and I see you as teachers of teachers, and you do the continuum from birth through 12. You look at the data, you discover where the needs are. It's prescriptive for the individual student. You find out what that individual student needs based on their test scores, and then you find strategies and resources to help that student um, with different methods because students need reading and writing in all disciplines. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. I thank you for working with the teachers to help them um, become better at their craft and reach um, a broader array of students in their needs. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Dr. Hall, Ms. Dvorak, Ms. Well, now we hear about the comprehensive plan. Right. So if those are the coaches, this is the playbook. Why are you so excited? So excited. Hello, everybody. Um, We are very excited to be here tonight um, to present our comprehensive literacy plan. Um, So as you know, we received the Striving Readers Grant earlier this year, at the end of last year. Um, And in order to qualify for the Striving Readers Grant, we had to do a comprehensive needs assessment for our county. um, And then we were able to use that data and information from the comprehensive needs assessment to create our comprehensive literacy plan. Um, And through that, we determined that there are five kind of areas that we wanted to focus on, which are um, presented in front of you now. Um, We also modeled our plan after MSDEs because we felt like we should be modeling what the state is doing as well. Um, And just keep in mind that the plan is quite comprehensive, so tonight is just gonna be an overview of key details. Um, So the first area of focus is key one of our instructional leadership. Um, And this is really focusing on developing instructional leaders, principals, teachers, anyone um, within the school system. Um, And our goal is to create instructional leaders who are knowledgeable on those evidence-based literacy practices and what is best for um, students and are able to share that knowledge with um, others. And uh, this is where our literacy coaches um, really come into play. So I'm going to give you a shout out for um, the early childhood um, literacy coach tonight. It is Lynn Treherne, and she's not here because she is running a parent, and there are actually teachers that showed up tonight for a conscious discipline workshop. So um, Lynn is a master teacher, just like all of the other literacy coaches. She is early childhood trained and credentialed, and she has experience teaching all early childhood grades pre-K, K, one and two for the last 25 years. So she's, she's wonderful. And you all have met Jamie Pepper tonight, um, and we were very lucky to have her as our K-5 literacy coach. She's also a master teacher. And I just have to say, it's amazing to see the impact that she's already made. I've had students and teachers make comments. Um, I was doing an op. Nobody wants me to come into their classroom, right? Because I'm evaluative. Um, But having someone be able to give that non-evaluative feedback, um, I've had a a teacher who's been here for years um, just kind of gloat and just say how amazing Jamie is. I was doing an observation and heard um, overheard students talking about, remember when Ms. Pepper came in, she was teaching us about these strategies. So you can really, you can already see the impact that she's having. Mm -hmm. So in secondary, you met the secondary um, coaches as well. And they talked a lot about their main focus really is on that disciplinary literacy. Um, And they have done amazing work. They are really the missing link in this whole, you know, vertical chain from elementary to middle to high. We've always had strong support in elementary middle. We finally have it in high school. Um, It is, they are, just a breath of fresh air. They're just amazing. Um, They're also working on those transitions between five and six, and they talked about supporting middle school, which they totally do. Um, Today, they facilitated a transition meeting with eighth and ninth grade English teachers talking about um, kind of those gaps when kids leave eighth grade and kids eighth grade teachers are getting ready to make recommendations for next year. 
and they, I mean, they planned it all. They still, I just showed up and, you know, <laughs> it was great. So, yeah, it was, it was great. Um, so it's, they really are, I can't say enough about the job that they're doing. And then key two is looking at strategic professional learning, and this is really focusing on creating a highly effective and sustainable um, system of professional development. And we know that our PD needs to be needs-based and support the continuum of literacy instruction. So for early childhood, one of the conditions of the grant was that we survey early childhood teachers, but we also survey the entire early childhood partnership. So we went to the Early Childhood Action Committee, that's part of local management, the Head Start Policy Council, the Judy Center Steering Committee, and um, just other early childhood advocates in the community. And resoundingly, what came back what, on that survey was, we need to really address social emotional learning, particularly from birth, um, because there's a huge body of evidence that says if children have those good social foundations, they develop executive functioning skills, which leads directly to reading. And so that is how we wrote that portion of the professional development in the grant. So um, what Mrs. Terhern is doing is really leading that work. Um, and we systematically started, when Dr. Smith said a late start, Mrs. Terhern started on January 14th. <laughs> so she's in there already. Um, but we have systematically decided with that start that we would have her begin with pre-K, then we work into the transition from pre-K to K, and so up through, and then she'll meet with Ms. Pepper to, to overlap on the first and second grade pieces. And part of the um, results of the survey was that we would have pre-K parent and family engagement workshops. Again, there's a huge body of research that needed to be cited in the grant that supports that, and our people want it. And you know, tonight at the tech center, there are parents there, there is childcare, there is dinner, and um, people are showing up for these things. So it's good. And for K through five, we're really using a lot of the structures that we have in place in St. Mary's County Public School, but really just thinking about how we can utilize them to better promote those literacy practices and looking at the continuum of literacy instruction from that development of phonemic awareness to those comprehension strategies. Um, so we still have team mentoring in place that meets with our new teachers to provide them with support, um, school-based PLCs, and we're really working um, with them to look at data and to make those database decisions in their planning and instruction um, and to meet collaboratively with each other. We have our instructional resource teachers and our literacy coaches um, who we utilize to support and strengthen all of the literacy programs um, across all content areas. Um, they're the ones in their modeling, helping teachers with those strategies. Um, many of our teachers have um, gone through the formative assessment for Maryland educators, the FAME, which looks at using formative assessment to again make those instructional um, decisions and then also continuing the use of peer coaching, but again with that focus on those literacy um, practices. So in secondary, and I think you'll see this pattern, my slides pretty much mirror Courtney's, um, and that's very purposeful because we really wanted to have the same focus and make it really consistent from elementary all the way through high school. Um, uh, the, this is really, to, I think Colleen Gill is still here. This is really her purview. She has got um, her hands really in this, the, not only this plan, but also the Striving Readers mm -hmm. Grant. So she really does a lot to facilitate the team mentoring and this vertical collaboration fame and the peer coaching. So if you have questions about those, I hope she's still back there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. She's sorry. Sorry. Excuse me, what is fame? What does that mean? It's formative assessment for Maryland educators. So it's a CPD, a continuing professional development course that teachers can um, pursue and learn, again, how to use um, different types of assessment to really drive instruction and learn about their students. So key three is looking at the continuity of standards-based instruction, and this is really focused on ensuring that all of our students have access to evidence-based instructional practices that are aligned to the Maryland College and Career Ready standards. So in early childhood, we're gonna begin at birth, and we're gonna go up through the early childhood component. So we are offering a lot of parent and provider workshops, and Mrs. Terhern, when she gets finished tonight, we have the conscious discipline trainer that's doing a specialized training for the child care providers and the Judy Center partners. So we have 60 people coming to Lexington Park Library tomorrow 
And I'm very proud to say those people that are coming tomorrow are going to get core of knowledge hours, which is credentialing for their child care. So there's really an incentive for them to come tomorrow so that we can make sure that we are aligned from birth all the way up through grade 12. Um, in the early childhood component, we are really starting to make sure that our pre-K standards align and mesh beautifully with kindergarten on up through, through all the grades. We want to make sure that our programs, even in the very early learning years, are aligning with college and career readiness standards and any materials that we've selected are evidence-based and on approved and recommended list. And we're really going to work hard on those transitions and Mrs. Treherne is going to lead the way with that. K through five, um, in 2015, um, we moved towards standards-based instruction and standards-based report cards, that's what SBRC stands for. Um, so right now they're in full swing in K through three and we have every intention of moving forward in fourth and fifth grade as well. In pre-K uh, pre pre two, thanks Kelly. Um, we have also worked really hard um, within the past couple of years, we have new instructional resources um, for the elementary level. So we're really working hard to make sure that our curriculum maps um, are, are again a standards based and really focusing on that standard and how we can use those instructional resources to support instruction. Um, again, that collaborative planning of instruction through content based um, PLCs and promoting th all of the, the resources available through the Maryland State Department of Education um, to really help teachers deepen their understanding of the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards of, for ELA, um, to know exactly what those standards mean and what those students, their students should be able to do. Um, so we're really focusing on those resources to build that teacher capacity. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so I think it was over a year ago, two years ago, I stood here and presented all these new materials. So we're in year two of implementation of Springboard Pearson um, in advanced language and literature in high school. So we are still figuring it out. We're still working, developing curriculum. The curriculum is done, but as any good teacher is going to do, they're going to take it and make it their own and massage it. And, um, and luckily we have, because the lit coaches are 11 month, we have, we're going to have that month in June with them. Um, and our plan really is to bring teachers in and to look at just massage the curriculum and just making it even better than it already is. Um, and I'm really pleased with these materials. I think teachers are happy, students are happy, I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're very rich and they're meeting our needs for sure. So. Key four is looking at our comprehensive system of assessments, which focuses on ensuring that SMCPS um, has a system of assessments that can be used for that strategic um, data informed decision making um, in order to meet the needs of all of our learners. So in early childhood we are beginning the universal screening to to really make sure that we have a good look at mm -hmm. who is likely to have a reading difficulty from as early as possible and we have implemented this year the indiv individual growth and development indicators we call them <coughs> D's for early literacy. It's a norm test. It's similar in the administration to, to Dibbles. Um, the teachers are really liking it. It's efficient, it's fast, and it's giving them really good information. We've also revised our risk factor assessment for when we open up the pre-K and Head Start um, uh, application process. We're taking a look at that. And then we're really working at um, creating developmentally appropriate assessments using skilled observation with rubrics. Because we know when they're little, you really can tell a lot by watching and interacting. So we just want to make sure that that's a very consistent process, sort of like in medicine. So you really do skilled observation. I think that's true of any age mm -hmm. as well. In elementary, we're continuing our universal screening process for K through five using uh, the Dibbles assessment, which is the dynamic indicators of basic early literacy skills. Through a separate grant, we're working with the National Center on Improving Literacy to really sure up our universal screening system. So we brought teachers in, um, retrained them on how to administer Dibbles, and they've met in universal screening teams to really look at the data and determine which students are struggling at risk for reading failure and come up with um, strategies and supports and interventions to, to support those students. Um, so it's nice how these two grants marry one another. Um, we also use you know a various formative and summative assessments. Of course, we have PARC for grades three through five um, and MISA for science um, and KRA in 
for kindergarten, um, but then there's county-based assessments as well. Um, since I have started this position, I'm in the process of rewriting the assessments to make sure that they are aligned to the standards and the rigor that's expected for students. Um, and so we have increased um, the number of PCRs or prose constructed responses. Actually getting students to respond to text in writing has been a big focus of our assessment system this year. Um, so in secondary, because it is year two of the, the new curriculum materials, we added unit assessments from these materials um, this year just to give us a little bit more formative um, data. We've always had the pre's and the mids um, that are more county-based. Everybody takes the same one. The unit assessments are course-based, which I think is really helpful for teachers because it's aligned exactly to the content that they just delivered. Um, the lit coaches talked about the PBAs. So this year we did design tasks for social studies and science, uh, and they mirror what kids are going to see on park. Um, so we did those in six, seven, eight, and nine. So they really have done more work than they actually share with you. The wet <laughs> seven and nine are really our focus groups um, that we're working with this year. So that's been pretty amazing to see. And like they said, they went in with kids and had them look at their writing on the science one, their writing on social studies, and writing on English. And it's been amazing just the aha moments kids have had because writing is so different in every single one of those content areas. Uh, and it's just the formative pieces of it, and there's, it's, you know, it's not held against them. They, they're revising it, they're going back and reworking some of that writing. Um, and it's just been really eye opening um, and very, very meaningful and powerful assessment. And you don't normally hear that with assessment. And finally, uh, key five looks at ensuring that. All students have access to our core literacy program, but that we have systems in place to identify students who may need more support and provide them with strategic and targeted intervention and enrichment. So in early childhood, you'll see how it's spiraling through the entire literacy plan and spiraling through the coach's work. We do have a universal screening in place, which is really very impressive that we are starting at four and every student up through grade two um, we also have our professional development related to executive functioning. We're doing conscious discipline, as I've mentioned before. And then we're using the data that we're collecting from those skilled observations and from IGDs to really differentiate instruction at the youngest level. Mm -hmm. And our literacy coach in early childhood is really working with staff to do that in the just few weeks that she's been here. Um, before I, we go to elementary, I just want to invite all of you tomorrow, if you're in the neighborhood of Lexington Park Elementary, from 8.30 till 4, there will be a fabulous conscious discipline training, and you are most welcome to join us. There's a lot going on with tiered intervention and instruction um, in elementary. Um, so we definitely want to do more with promoting that universal design for learning and that core instruction and making sure that teachers are aware of all the different supports that they can put in place for students, um, for all students, not just students who are struggling. And this is also where the Goal Book Pathways ties in as well, which the literacy coaches talked about. Um, we have our universal screening for our students in, well, pre-K through fifth grade. Um, we, through this grant too, we've had the opportunity to pilot Imagine Learning, which is a, online system that students will log in and they'll take a test and it'll kind of create an individualized learning pathway for them. But the power in that is that the data that the teachers get, they're called action area tools, that they can then log in, look at the action area tools, and then it, the teachers will pull those students for that targeted instruction. So it's not just that they're sitting online on a computer, um, that teacher intervention is definitely key to that. So we are piloting that with targeted second grade students in a handful of elementary schools based on data and teacher input. Um, we are also working with the Department of Special Education um, to make sure that we are kind of shoring up our approved elementary reading interventions. and. Providing more, um, just an overview of the interventions for teachers um, so that they know like what each intervention targets and which students should, um, it would be appropriate for. Um, and then also looking at that progress monitoring and response to intervention. So just because a student, we want to make sure that students in interventions, we're monitoring to see if they're making that progress because if that, they're not, then we need to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new plan. Um, so, and we're doing that through our Performance Matters Unify system. Thanks.
again, same things. Um, so in secondary, we don't have as many of those tier two and tier three interventions. So we really do rely more on tier one with UDL um, goal book pathways. And we've been really fortunate to have Susie Fowler, who's went into all the high schools in the fall um, and worked with ninth grade teachers, went in and watched them using goal book pathways, gave them some feedback. Um, Cause that's the, I think that's been funded through a grant as well, right? Like a different grant. Um, and then we do look at our digital resources with Pearson, Springboard, um, ALL as differentiation tools as well because a lot of what's in that digital platform is meant to differentiate instruction. So we've been doing ongoing support with our vendors um, and with us teachers that are really skilled at it. Um, so that's just an ongoing um, piece of the work that we're doing in terms of um, the interventions. There you have it. There you have it. <laughs> Questions, comments? We had a very thorough presentation, so I have no questions for you. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Uh, I really like the idea that you are catching these children very early on and working in partnership with daycare providers and with other people because that's that's really important, especially when their brain is developing to uh, to work on things. Then. Thank you. There's Thank you. so much research that shows that if we don't get students reading by third grade, then they're never going to be on track. Um, the amount of interventions and resources that you would have to put um, forth is astronomical. So we're really trying to target them as early as possible. Good. Um, my question um, is based on um, how much time we're, are we spending on assessment versus how much are we teaching. Now, I'm the messenger here, so don't don't blame me. Okay, I'm not a dinosaur. And what Mrs. Weaver said, I agree 100%. We have to do intervention. Mm -hmm. Having said that, <clears throat> a number of my uh, friends are concerned that we need to put as much time as possible in the three R's. And it kind of worked for them, it worked for me. Mm -hmm. Didn't have I didn't have all this stuff. Uh, so in terms of this assessment, uh, Dr. Jeffers talked at length about this a couple months ago. I was so impressed about the data that they're getting and the information that they're getting, but w at what cost? So could you address that? I know you're teaching the teachers. But. I can certainly speak from the early childhood um, aspect and then yeah. roll on. We are really looking at a whole child philosophy and letting children be children. So some of the assessments that we are doing are really based on observation and scoring them with a rubric and making sure that we're really consistent in how we score. Um, the IGDES test, you know, each time they do it, it gets faster. Yep. 10 minutes a child. Yeah, that, 10, 15 minutes yeah. a child. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. So three times a year. Okay. Um, you know, so we're really being mindful of that, and as we work with the providers and as we work with the early childhood teachers, we're reinforcing that when they're young like that, every 15 or 20 minutes, they need a different activity, a different transition to something else in a very secure environment, because that's really the, the amount of time that they can attend. So right. they are not taking, the little people are not taking paper and pencil tests all day, that, that's not happening. And please also remember that um, a couple of years ago, the legislature stepped in and put a, a limit on us. Mm -hmm. And so no school system in the state mm -hmm. can go beyond 2% of the, a student's time right. in assessments. So um, there, were, there was voluminous, doc, voluminous documentation to show what tests were being given, how much time it was taken. Um, at what levels they were being given, uh, and then from all of that, it was distilled down and, and this determination that no more than 2%. So, um, you know, it is, it is certainly something that is and has been on people's radar. Um, so I think you can assure your friends that, um, that uh, we are staying within the bounds of that 2%. And that's the thing that, that we really worked hard at is we needed to have a, a, a universal screener to, to take a look at, you know, literacy problems down the line. We also needed to write a language and literacy evidence-based measure into striving readers to win. They're the same assessment for little people. So we really looked at we don't need to choose two assessments, 
we can find one that will serve multiple purposes. And Michelle and I have definitely worked with Dr. Fancella and Dr. Jaffers to make sure that our assessments are in within that 2% um, and constantly looking at them to make sure that they are providing teachers with valuable information and we're not just assessing students to assess students. We want the data that teachers get from the assessments to be actionable and to have a direct impact on their instruction. So that's our goal. Yeah, and I would, I would second that. Um, and that's why our focus is on formative, not summative, because mm -hmm. it's in right. real time. Um, like I said, the work that they're doing with students, like here's, let's take a look at the writing, this is what you got on that, and how do we make this better, and how is that gonna help you um, down the road? So if it's not actionable, it's not right. worth So we really have worked hard to make sure that the tests and the assessments that we're giving countywide, uh, we can't control how many assessments teachers give beyond that, but that they are really meaningful and that the data and the conversations that come out of it are gonna benefit students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my only question is, Okay, so my understanding is that you, the testing for a child that might be identified as special education begins in second grade, correct? Or, or somewhat prior, like, you know, like that's when they go through the whole battery of tests to see if they are going to be in a special education program. So how, if, if you have a, a student that is struggling from pre-K through second grade, <laughs> how do you identify that and how do you coordinate with the special education teachers because the does the job all fall to you or at that point are you are you pulling other resources in does that make sense yeah just give me a moment to process um, so we start with with the universal screening mm -hmm. school and what that does is it allows us to just kind of it kind of gives us like a alarm like there might be something right. going on with this kiddo and then from there, we might do other formative assessments to really kind of pinpoint whether or not there is, um, and not even a learning disability, but we just know that the student is struggling with reading for some reason, why are they struggling with reading? Um, so then, you know, we look at our core program and think about what supports we can, that's where we start. And then we might provide that student with uh, intervention with an instructional resource teacher, teacher um, to support them. We're gonna monitor them. Um, so I don't think there's anything that really says that special education testing doesn't start till second grade, but what we would like to make sure is that we have given um, students access to education. Um, so that means, you know, early child, you know, kindergarten is usually their first time in right. school, so that they've had that access, that they've been provided with that core instruction, that they've been provided with supports, and usually once there's some evidence that we, all of these supports have been in place, and that's when the, they'll go to that PST table or the IEP right. table. So, I mean, but if, if, I yeah. have a, if I have a child that starts second grade that's not reading on grade level, mm -hmm. then what, when, when, what are you, what have you done prior to that to get them to advance more quickly, or what are you going to do to continue to do that in order? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you, there's always children that are falling mm -hmm. behind. Right. So are those the I mean, I know that's who you're working with, yeah. but yet how difficult is it for you to get them caught up or will they ever be caught up and then working on a grade level? I, I would say there's, if we can get them early enough, then we can put all those supports and interventions in place to help get them caught up. It's when we're seeing that the supports and interventions aren't working and that's kind of when something. And the rationale yeah. with this approach with executive functioning social foundations in the early years yeah. will hopefully mitigate that so they will right. become more ready to learn as they get into the school those early school years we also um, when you know a pediatrician detects a problem you know at the we, hospital we provide special we provide special ed services toddlers. that right. begin at birth that's yes. why we say birth through yeah. we're not giving we're not giving educational services to children who aren't identified pre-K, you know, that, that, that is, that, you know, so a child that ha a special education student could be as, can be exactly. identified quite early. What you're talking about is by the time we get to the end of second grade, right. should be yeah. they, they should, should, should be, be identified right. and right. remediated and intervened mm -hmm. and they, and that's, that's the yeah. system that we're, that we're working from. Right. The, there, there isn't, there won't be a child who's been with us in, in a pre-K, K, grade one, grade two, it doesn't come as a surprise. No, they're not know, identified in second just, grade. Just, That's like, just what they might be formalized in a way. I've heard from parents that they're just, they're, there is some sense of frustration right. because, you know, as a parent, you know if your child is struggling in school, but yet the resources 
you know, either there aren't enough of them or they don't mm -hmm. know how to get them. So it just seems to be that there is this 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 pushback between administration and the parents in order for them to quote unquote fight to get their child where they need to be. And I that's that's just, you know, if with with this whole program up and running, I think a lot of that will be I think that was that's the piece right. that we were missing. Yeah. Yeah. Right, because yeah. everyone's like, oh, well, just wait until you're tested, or, you know, and even though we're still doing the testing, until you have that sheet of paper that they're on a 504 plan, I think some parents felt that they weren't getting all of the resources that yeah. they could. And, I, and so our hope is ideally, if you think about um, the tiers of instructional support, mm -hmm. our core instructional program should be enough to support 80% of our right. students. And really that's where our focus needs right. to be. Um, so I think through the professional development, through the focus on good evidence-based teaching practices, through making sure that the resources we have, we're using them to support um, those and the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards, I, I have a good feeling that we're going to get there. Right. I think there's a lot of good things in place kind of in pockets and we're kind of bringing it all right together. and that's right yes. that's just by listening to yep. this between the the coaches in here I think that's what's mm -hmm. bringing it all together yes. and now it's just it's more complete yes rather than picking mm -hmm. pieces it's from cool. different it's a it's it's a comprehensive yes. literacy plan yeah. that have has five key elements it starts with great people <laughs> great who coaches. give great professional yeah. development that gives oh, great instruction <laughs> that gives great assessment that informs really great interventions yeah. These are the five, the fabulous five, and the other fabulous five, five keys. So together, it's like this. It's like it all works together. There's your T-shirt, Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, he is wound up. Yeah, he is. No, I'm, I'm, I'm. We're really excited and passionate about this work. I think this is really some of the, some of the most thoughtful work that we've done as a system. It's so big and it goes down to, not to use an Alex Jaffer's term, but like granularity. It's all those little, it's those little pieces so that when a teacher is giving a, a, a formative assessment in a classroom, we have aligned a tool that gathers incredibly informative data that can be drawn all the way back up the system to inform larger programs. It's very, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really, now we have everybody in place. We have a really good plan. We've done a PowerPoint. Um, I can't <laughs> wait to see you know where we are in the next several years and I think that people that that m may have had frustration in the past um, if they if they give us a, a true open mind and a real true look they're going to be amazed at what we share with them right and that right yeah. please the, come the, tomorrow watch the daycare provider workshop if you yeah. can oh yeah. The only comment I want to so add is you I had no, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm just getting Dang. started. We've we, we got till nine o'clock. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh homework. Okay, I'll be brief. Uh, the uh, I think was uh, mentioned uh, earlier about the uh, uh, the uh, kids learning at different levels. And I don't know, I'm not a, a trained uh, specialist, but sometimes kids uh, are, are slow learners or, you know, and they, they develop at a later age. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to discern between that and say somebody that needs special, special help? Um, you know, they're just... Take it, sure. Um, well, at, with the youngest people, you know, there is a developmental range, not unlike, you know, a, a young child and we have several nurses on the board I, I think you'll understand what I'm saying you know there's a typical range of walking from mm -hmm. like right seven or nine months to 15 months right. and you know if you're in that range okay things are moving you're approaching the next milestone where you need to be early acquisition of language and literacy and social skills that lead to reading follow similar um, a similar pathway there is a range when we see children starting to get out of the range, then we need to intervene. And as uh, Mrs. Dvorak said, if they're little people, about 80% of them are gonna be in the range. And when they're not, we have to craft the experiences and the opportunities and the right support for our teachers to, to give them that opportunity to get them back into the range. And so we're watching that really from, from birth on. And you know, there are gonna be pediatricians in this work yeah. with our youngest people. So right. I think that should, should mitigate some of that yes, that you're talking you. about. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you two have anything to quickly add? No. <laughs> I think everything's been said. Okay. But okay. Yeah. I, actually, I, I actually think do. what you. No. Go ahead. As, as a nurse. Uh, go ahead. I think you were going to hit on the nurse point. Um, <laughs> I was. I'm I was next. going to express gratitude um, because my daughter was a struggling reader. <laughs> And um, I was, and so I know personally what those gaps are like mm -hmm. and how over time the system has um, put supports in place. You know, I was lucky because Mrs. Hall was principal and I went to her and said, I've been telling people for years their issues. Yes, that's and what I'm talking about. Nobody, yeah. right nobody <laughs> will <laughs> agree. You know, I, I tell them and they go, no, I've never seen that. And then a week later I get a call. You're right. I did notice that. But because she was quiet and didn't, uh, didn't cause issues in the classroom, um, she was somebody who was overlooked. Mm -hmm. And by the time... Um, Mrs. Hall came in and was able to um, work on some supports for her. She had developed some strategies, so when she was tested, it, it, she didn't test out as needing special education, and yet there were identified gaps, and, um, and so I was just really fortunate because there were really talented teachers who stepped in and were able to, to do some of these things. What I'm really pleased by now is that um, that this kind of work has been identified and prioritized and put into place. Because what I really hope is that no other mother has to sit up here and say, my child um, struggled and, and how difficult it was for um, everyone in the family. And so I just have to express my gratitude because, um, but for those special people, um, you know, it would have had a very different outcome, and, um, and so I believe that this comprehensive program um, is what is needed. It is what is, has been perhaps the missing um, piece to pull everything, sort of the keystone to pull everything together. And, um, it, and you know, it, it is true that there, there is that continuum, and there are kids who are going to come in early and be stellar, and there are other kids who um, are going to struggle for a variety of reasons, not necessarily need, needing special education, but rather having a different learning style mm -hmm. and, um, and making sure that we are addressing that learning style uh, because education is not a one-size-fits-all medium, and, um, and so over the time that I have served as a board member, I have seen um, just a real um, richness being brought in uh, to address a wide range of individuals it, where they need to be addressed. And so I think we are about as close now to individual education programs for each student as we're probably ever going to get. Um, it would be lovely if we could, you know, have that written out for every single child and follow through, but I think with the data that we have, the data systems that we have, the professional development that's offered, and the work that's being done, um, I think we're... We have the most comprehensive learning profiles that we've ever had in St. Mary's County Public Schools due to, due to Unify and Goal Book and things such as that. I mean, it really is. So, um, you know, we, we passed the budget, um, money very well spent on people and programs and um, so thank you. So. Mm, thank you for sharing that. Ooh. Sitting here, w what I've heard you say, you're a scientist. It's, you are. It's prescriptive and it's meaningful. You identify the students as to when they need it, what they need, and how they need it to help the students. And the literacy plan that you attach is full of additional information if we want to dig deeper into our comprehensive literacy plan. So thank you ladies for all that you do to help our students because literacy is, is the foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, all right. finally, yeah. Dr. Farrell, Maybe. sitting patiently in the back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Dr. Farrell, Dr. Beasley. We're going to finish Mr. as we ended with a conversation about national board certification. So I brought the binder of certification. Oh, my goodness. Because <laughs> I heard that you guys wanted to learn all about it. <laughs>
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I haven't done my weights today, so yeah, if you would like you me go. to lift weights, like, looks like this right there. So this this is the binder. This is all the policies and regulations from MSDE that have to do with certification, and. Um, Going through there the training that, for that. There needs to be a Paperwork Production Act on to, that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, That's seriously? Yeah. That right. Is a it, it takes a year to go through. Um, Mr. Rose was our most recent uh, trainee that went through the program. Um, here in St. Mary's, we have four people that are authorized to issue certificates. Um, as far as I know, no other school system in Maryland has four people. Um, so sometimes um, other systems are a little jealous of us. but. Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, so to kind of quickly give you guys just like a little slice of certification in Maryland, um, there's a few routes to how people become, can become certified in Maryland. Um, one is to complete a Maryland approved program, which means they go to a Maryland college that's already been approved by MSDE, that has a teacher ed program. They complete that program, they pass all the tests, and they get employed by us and we issue them a certificate. That's one way and kind of sometimes the easiest way. Um, then there's out-of-state approved programs. So this is um, people that have graduated from Pennsylvania, New York. They completed a teacher ed program that was approved by that state's education department and they've completed tests um, and their endorsement area matches something that we have here in Maryland, which doesn't always match. Sometimes states have different certification areas than we have. Um, the next is national board certification. So um, as you guys talked earlier, um, once you obtain national board certification in the state of Maryland, you can get your certification just by having national board certification regardless of where you got it, as long as it's in an area that matches state certification here. So, and not all states do that. And then the next, um, which is probably the most convoluted, is experienced professionals. So if you have 27 months of teaching experience in the last seven years in the area that you hold the endorsement then you can come to Maryland and get that certificate also now let's say you have several endorsement areas like let's say you have English and Spanish and math but you only taught English for 27 months out of the last seven you only get English you don't get all the rest um, unless, of course, then you've also taken the test that Maryland requires for those other areas, and you can have them added on and stuff like that. So, there's a couple other routes to certification that are important for you guys to know and understand. Um, one is a transcript analysis. So, a lot of times when you guys have uh, an appointment before you that says that they're kind of a conditional teacher, what we're doing is we're doing a transcript analysis to find out what they've already done and what they might still need to do in order to become certified. If they're not in a program, like a graduate program that's gonna to lead to certification, they're just gonna piecemeal together the coursework to try to get certified, that's what we call a transcript analysis. So we, the four of us in human resources that are certified by the state to issue certificates, can do transcripts analysis, but only for individuals that are employed by the board as certificated teachers. So we're not allowed by the state, we're not allowed to do them for like paraeducators. We're not allowed to do them for secretaries. We're not allowed to do them for building service workers. We can only do transcript analysis if you're employed by the board under a teacher's contract. Otherwise, the state wants to do them because they own it all. So once a, a transcript analysis is issued, it's good for three years. So the state wants to know that they can take that wherever they go into whatever school system they decide to go into if it's not St. Mary's. Um, and then the last is a resident teacher program. If um, you've been around a while, you remember that we used to have a resident teacher program with the College of Notre Dame um, that lasted for several years um, until kind of the budget crisis hit and then we um, stopped kind of hiring uh, resident teachers. But resident teacher programs means that uh, an individual enrolls in a program that's approved by the state, again, um, by MSDE, and they complete certain coursework before they ever get hired by the Board of Education and before they ever start teaching. But they're also continuing to get that coursework throughout the time that they're employed by the board. So. Then we talk about 
types of certificates. So once you get through the pathway, then you're issued a type of certificate. So a conditional certificate, um, which you guys know means that you haven't met the full requirements to become fully certified in the state of Maryland. Conditional certificates are only good for two years and one person can only ever have two conditional certificates in their lifetime. You can't have any more than two conditional certificates ever. Um, you have to complete at least 12 credits of your, your transcript analysis or your um, required credits to move to renew for a conditional certificate um, if you don't finish them all in the first two years. Did I miss anything on that? Basic skills. Uh, and you also have to have completed your basic skills assessment, which is usually practice one or SAT scores or ACT, something like that. Um, then standard professional one is what most teachers get. So straight out of college, you've just graduated with your bachelor's degree in, in education. Um, you haven't started teaching yet. You're gonna get an SPC one. It's good for five years. Um, you can never renew an SPC one. Um, so during the five years, you have to take at least six credits. They have to be your reading credits, if nothing else, um, if you haven't already met the reading requirements. Uh, if you don't, do everything that's required to move to the advanced professional certificate, then you get what's called a standard professional two. That's good for another five years. Um, and by the end of that five year period, you must either qualify for your APC, or if you haven't already had two conditional certificates, you can go to a conditional certificate, but that impacts tenure and pay. So then the advanced professional certificate, um, you have to have at least three years of teaching. You have to have earned either a master's degree, 36 credits, or a national board certificate. Um, and this is what most teachers get um, once they've, they've been around a little while. What, what Either they've gotten their three years done, or they've gotten their master's done, or their master's equivalency. Um, so Scott and I, that's what we have, uh, an APC. And, we have to renew that every five years. Every five years, we have to present at least six credits. Um, they have to be in reading if we haven't already met the reading requirement. Um, counselors always have to present one credit for Lauren's Law to renew their APC or any other certificate. Um, and we have that all the way up until what we call a senior teacher waiver. Senior teacher waiver means once you reach age 55 or you have 25 years of service then you no longer have to present your six credits to renew your certificate you can renew it under senior teacher except if you're a school counselor then you still have to present your one credit for lauren's law that's not exempt from the senior teacher waiver every time you move from one certificate to another the state always asks us have they met their reading requirements so we know for uh, elementary that is they have to have 12 credits in reading for secondary and k through 12 they have to have six if you hold both if you hold an elementary and a secondary or elementary and a k through 12 endorsement you have to have the 12 credits to keep your um, elementary endorsement um, Basic skills and, and pedagogy and content tests, of course, that's a basic requirement for the state of Maryland. You have to have those um, to get past your, your conditional certificate, to get past your SPC1 or SPC2 into your APC. And at every phase of this, you have to complete what we call a professional development plan, which kind of says you have a plan moving forward in the next five years of what you're gonna do to meet your renewal requirements before your certificate expires. Will you explain what Lauren's Law is? Lauren's Law is the requirement for suicide prevention um, for counselors, and it was enacted two years ago, I believe. 2016, in the fall. And it's also student trauma, so it has to be a combination of pre suicide prevention with our students and then how to deal with students who have experienced trauma. Thank you. So all counselors in the state of Maryland have to have that before they can renew their certificate. So Colleen is going to jump up and help me with the national board certification because she is now the expert on it, speaking about it so much tonight. Go ahead. Oh, oh. <laughs> I thought I was just the compliment okay. to your. 
<laughs> so uh, in order to, to achieve national board certification, you must have at least a bachelor's degree. Again, that's the minimum requirement for certification in the state of Maryland. You have to hold a valid teaching certificate in a state um, for Maryland, it's Maryland, of course. Um, and then three years of successful classroom teaching experience or school counseling. Um, for Maryland, there's 25 certificate, I mean, for the national boards, there's 25 certificate areas, um, 16 different, different disciplines, and four different developmental levels. And those are early childhood or childhood, adolescence and young adulthood. So the four components for a national board are content knowledge assessment, uh, differentiation and instruction, teaching practice and learning environment, and effective and reflective practitioner. Practitioner. Practitioner, <laughs> my God. <laughs> um, so these are the four components. Teachers, um, national board re um, revised the process. Um, I initially certified as a national board um, certified teacher back in, and I always get this wrong, um, it was 2004. I always want to say 1994, but that is not true at all. It was, <laughs> 2004. It was 2004, and then I renewed um, my, in my window in 2013. So they revised it in about 2015 to make it, so when I went through, it was a one-year process. You had to do um, like five, six components. Now it's four components and you have a three-year window. So um, candidates can really decide how they're going to work on certification and in what order. Um, can you go back one? Mm -hmm. um, so content knowledge assessment is component one. That is actually a, a test. They have to go, uh, candidates have to go to an actual testing center. Um, there's a testing window, actually um, the, the um, candidate mm -hmm. component window opens in the next few days. So the window is, um, I believe it's April through June. They have to actually go somewhere. Our nearest one is Alexandria, I think. You sit for an actual test. Um, it's like a praxis test or something else. Um, even though it's component one, candidates can take it whenever they want. Um, it's, it's a culminating. Um, differentiation and in instruction is the component two. Um, you're looking at student work samples. You're really looking at what are students producing? How are we showing movement and growth in our students? What are we doing when things go wrong? Um, teaching practice and learning environments, candidates have to, for component three, they have to videotape their practice, small group, whole group, um, and demonstrate their prowess and pedagogy. And then effective and reflective practitioner of the fourth component um, is really all about what the teacher does to further their own teaching profession, their pedagogy, but really how them furthering their own teaching all comes back to students and students are really the heart of every single component of national board certification um, and they are driving the process it's all about how I can improve my practice for the students that I work with so as I said um, sorry I kind of took over um, one to three years it's the choice um, candidates have that window if for some reason they do not, and it's, um, there are threshold th score thresholds for each component, but there, it's a combined score report at the end. If they don't, if a candidate does not make the combined score, they can redo components. So we already have um, candidates who are worried about one of their components. They're going to redo a component before they're even finished, um, just to make sure they make that score threshold. Um, and then at the end, so it used to be a 10-year certification, now it's down to a five-year certification, and you can renew that every, yes. But it's a maintenance of certification, so it's more about, instead of me looking back on the past 10 years of my life and figuring <coughs> out how to write about that in two pages or less, it's a maintenance of certification, they're still rolling that out of what am I doing to continue on this journey towards this, you know, really putting my students first and um, elevating my practice. Now back to you. Okay, so there's there's two ways that we can support uh, candidates for national board. One is through a fee waiver grant program through MSDE. Um, they would only have to pay seventy five dollars of the total nineteen seventy five costs. Or um, if they're not chosen for the fee waiver incentive program, they can always use tuition reimbursement funds as we have negotiated in each of our agreements. Um, they would pay the $75 and then we would pick up the 1975 for the rest of them. Do you want to talk about that? Um, 
Okay. So um, national board certification, it is, I always talk with teachers about how it is the ultimate professional development experience. It really requires you to stop and reflect on your practice. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And how is it really helping students? Um, instead of just going on with the, the same old, same old. So um, it is, national board certification came out of the idea of, of elevating the teaching profession to sort of what doctors go through, and there's been a lot of medical talk, but um, doctors are board certified. Um, let's have teachers. What is the national standards for teachers? Because we don't always have those. Um, so it is kind of that highest mark for a lot of teachers. It's, it's the next step. Um, I encourage teachers in their five-year plan, every time they renew their certificate, I'm like, maybe national board certification is something we have to look into. Um, you can talk about the money. So, <laughs> so in our uh, negotiated agreement, we um, have authorized if once a candidate achieves national board certification, they can have a three thousand dollars stipend, which is spread out, of course, uh, over the course of twenty six pays um, for the lifetime of their certificate. So it used to be that that stipend was good for ten years. Now it will be good for five years, and if they renew, another five, and so on and so on. Um, MSDE also offers a, a matching stipend, um, but that comes and goes. So sometimes it's $1,000, sometimes it's $2,000. Um, it all depends on whether you're in a comprehensive needs school as identified by MSDE or not a comprehensive needs school. Um, and that, that stipend has really um, been a bit of controversy lately with whether or not MSD has the money to cover it, uh, with the number of national board certified teachers in the state increasing, um, that that price tag increases as well, and so the state has to come up with that that money sometime. So, so uh, St. Mary's County Public Schools has 38 nationally board certified teachers and 16 in the process. So those are some great numbers, especially for a school system our size. I have no questions, thank you. This is a lot of great background information because we do see, you know, when we are approving someone to come in and teach, like we have, you know, whether they're certified or it's provisional and things like this. And this is very helpful in, in having that knowledge now. Thank you. And besides the, the route that most take, which is a Maryland approved program or a out of state right. approved program, um, those that are coming to you conditionally certified they're just as unique as we all are so mm -hmm. their starting point is so different each one of them there's no two that are alike um, just because our backgrounds are so different too so every time you see someone that's coming with uh, conditional certification to mm -hmm. you I, I can't tell you that theirs is the same as, as Colleen's or mine or Brian's mm -hmm. they're all unique just because their background is so unique too um, my daughter uh, was certified in uh, Virginia. It's expired. She's teaching in uh, Abu Dhabi. She hopefully will come back. Um, the fact that <laughs> yeah, that's a whole. I'm sorry, Jim. <laughs> uh, if she if she comes back um, with an expired uh, certification in Virginia, uh, will that have any? Uh, will that help her? get certified in uh, Maryland? I would encourage her to get her certificate renewed in Virginia now. That way it's ready to be transferred to Maryland. Mm -hmm. It's easier to transfer an active certificate than it is an expired certificate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is very, very interesting what you guys are doing. And the first thing I thought of when you started is Dr. Smith has made it very clear, of course you and your department, that we, we have to import teachers. Well, we live in Southern Maryland and we have thousands of retired engineers that could very well uh, with, uh, in my opinion, probably step right in and start teaching, you know, math, science. Mm -hmm. And um, so I know you covered it very well about how to, how to get certified and everything, but it seems to me that you being an HR director that you could sit somebody down ask them to do a PowerPoint on any subject that they want and assess pretty much within a half an hour whether they have the ability number one do they know the subject matter and number two can they teach um, 
So I guess I'm cursing the darkness here <laughs> where you have a, a tremendous uh, capability in the county. Is it any easier way that we can get these uh, retired teachers? And by the way, most of them are not interested in a 20-year career. You know, they may be five years and, you know, they retire when they're 65 and they want to hang it up when they're 75. So we've got this massive resource here. I'm just wondering if there's any easy way that we can get these people on board. Um, in the state of Maryland, no. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thus, sorry, thus the binder that's, that's right, and, and I will tell you that MSDE I was there on yesterday and they were talking about actually shutting down one of these pathways and making it more challenging mm -hmm. to obtain a Maryland teaching certificate and when you look at the fact that it's not just do you know the subject matter but it's classroom management it's understanding the development of uh, you know, psychological um, development of students. Um, I've, we have had in the past, you know, engineers come in to teach, um, and they might have been effective engineers, but not so much in well, teaching. I think to so Jim's point, I, I don't. I think what the problem is with the with the certifications and what MSCE is doing is where you run into the roadblock is with your CTE. Uh, teachers, right? Like, right. go find an HVAC instructor that's go or an HVAC person that's going to want to come back and go to school right. for two years and you know take thirty six right. credits just so he or she can stand in a classroom and talk about something that they've done for thirty years. And, and that's a that, whole different right. policy yeah. when you right. look yeah. at exactly. trades and industry. So. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and actually, Anne Arundel County. Um, I, I don't know if they've continued to pursue it, but they were looking at um, pursuing some legislation that would allow them to. Um, Hire individuals for um, adjunct very professor. right um, very specific situations um, in in hard to recruit uh, areas. So that did pass. It's actually called it? adjunct professor, and it's um, you can get an adjunct certificate if you only teach one, one period course. a day once uh, one period a day for a year. That's very good. So wow. just one period. And is that statewide? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I imagine the compensation level for one period a day would really draw somebody right. from a lucrative engineering or HVAC career to become, yeah. yeah. Of course, she's not saying that all engineers are academically challenged, I'm sure she's not. <laughs> all right, Mary, what do you have? <laughs> just stop right now. I want to say congratulations to 38 National Board Certified Teachers that we have in SMCPS, and the 16 that switches to them, the 16 who are also in the process of becoming nationally board certified, because it is a rigorous and challenging program to get there. And I appreciate that they are lifelong learners, and they are just moving on up the pinnacle of their um, profession. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all the work that you do. I appreciate all of you in HR. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. I just, you can I, gavel us close now. No, well, <laughs> no, no, well, it turns out I'm with you for four. Hey, I, I will say, one of the reasons that we, that we really wanted to bring this. You contract and you just all chat. <laughs> one of, I'm always chatting. One of the reasons why we wanted to bring this forward was in lieu of, there's a great amount of conversation about the Kerwin Commission, the professionalization of the teaching, uh, of the teaching field. I would say you're already absolutely, it already is more than adequately professional. But they're trying to simplify and to simply say that everybody should be nationally board certified. The amount of effort that goes into the dedication, the commitment to craft, the support that the school system and the school and the other staff members provide to help people through the process is what makes it valuable. It is not something that can be uh, mass marketed to all but in that's a not what they, But they haven't talked about that whole piece of it in the current – like I want to take a picture of that binder and I want to send it up there. I mean – yeah. I mean, in all honesty, and I mean, everyone just talk. I'm really sorry, Lake. Um, it's okay. Take your time. Um, but I mean, everyone's just talking around. I mean, everyone's talking about this national board certification as if it's just like, oh, I'll just go do this, right? Or like study for the CPA and take the test, and you know, it's over in you know, it's six months. But what they don't see is the background support and how much, yeah, how much of a, and I'm going to use the word burden or maybe strain on the 
the it's already, a system left. Right, yeah. in, on the system in order to to get those teachers through that program. I, so. I mean, talk to some of your, your teachers that you've had. I mean, parents that you've had on sabbatical leave this year. I mean, They're going the through burden the that they've taken yeah. um, just to get through that hump of student teaching right. so that they can become teachers with us. Great. This is just another example of Kerwin having gone off the rails from what it was supposed to I do. Know. Okay. <laughs> anyone else? I knew, I knew Kathy was going to get that jab in somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't disappoint. Okay, anyone have anything else? All right, next meeting, just before St. Patrick's Day, people, March 13th at 9 a.m., wear your green. All right, and we are done. We are. <laughs> oh and I didn't even say this. <laughs>